everybody, welcome back to Let's Go Geo. As usual, I'm your field guide, Heather, and today we are talking about sedimentary rocks. I'm coming to you today from Utah, which is a great place for our discussion today because as you can see behind me, there's a wonderful sequence of sedimentary formations. These are primarily Mesozoic, Cretaceous, and Jurassic stuff, and I just ran around here. I'm on the terraces along the Green River, and I ran around and picked up some rocks for us to talk about today. These rocks form from grains of different sizes and fossils and hard parts of organisms and precipitated minerals. But how does this stuff get turned into an actual rock rather than just, say, a handful of sand, some shells, or minerals? There are four main types of sedimentary rocks. So let's explore them. Clastic sedimentary rocks are made up of clasts or grains of different sizes. The term lithics refers to the broken pieces of pre-existing rock. Now these grains vary all the way from the finest silts and clays to the sands to pebbles, cobbles, and bowls. Now you're probably familiar with those terms just from everyday talk, but did you know they actually have technical meanings? In fact, silts are defined as less than 1 to 56th of a millimeter, and boulders would be defined as more than 256 millimeters in size. All the rest of them are somewhere in between. Take a look at this sandstone right here. You might recognize it's made of sand, but sand also has a specific size. In fact, sand grains are defined as 1 16th to 2 millimeters in size. Now the coolest thing about knowing your grain sizes is that it can be really easy to then determine what type of clastic sedimentary rock you the have. The clays are the finest grain size we have, and that's less than 1 256th of a millimeter. And that gives us clay stones, mudstones, and shales. Next in line are the silts, and silts give us silt stones. After that we have sand, which gives us sandstone. Now, above sand-sized grains, above two millimeters in size, we have our pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. Anything from two to 256 millimeters is in that range, and those give us rocks such as breccias and conglomerates. The next type are chemical sedimentary rocks, those that form from chemical processes, like the precipitation of minerals out of solution. Great examples are those evaporates, like gypsum and rock salt. We can find examples of these, like at the Great Salt Lake, where we can find halite, which forms rock salt. We can find other great examples in Triassic red beds, where we see layers of gypsum rock. Here's an example of gypsum right here. Another great example is chert. Chert forms from the precipitation of silica from groundwater. And we can see it in examples like agates, which form these concentric ring patterns. We can also see this in fossil wood, and in things like flint, which are common with arrowheads. And sometimes this crystalline silica even replaces things like fossils, such as in this limestone. Another example is travertine, which is a calcium carbonate rock that you can find deposited around hot springs. So a great place to see this is around Yellowstone. Biochemical sedimentary rocks form when living organisms extract dissolved ions out of water and make things like bones, shells, and hard parts. Limestone is a great example of these types of rocks. And finally, organic sedimentary rocks form when stuff like plant matter accumulates, and then we get rocks such as coal. The formation of these sedimentary rocks includes a number of steps. So let's take a look at those. The first is weathering, the physical and chemical processes that give us these grains in the first place. Now this can be from the activity of rain, water, animals, and plants. Roots can dig down in and break apart rocks. Ice, animals can burrow. All of this gives us different sized grains. And all of this breaks apart rocks into smaller and smaller pieces. Next is erosion and transport. This material has to be moved and deposited somewhere. So the erosive activities of things like ice and the transport of this stuff through mainly wind, water, and sometimes ice, like glaciers, will move the material until it finds a place to settle. Now transportation can be slower or it can happen really fast. Some great examples of this happening fast include things like landslides or mudslides. Next is deposition. And that's when these lithics and this material actually gets deposited somewhere. 
Now, it indicates to us that there was a change in energy in the system. And it also can tell us something about the medium that moved the material. Now, this material gets laid down successionally, one layer on top of another. And if you remember, that is called original horizontality. And lastly, there's lithification or diagenesis. Now, this is when we actually turn this stuff into a rock. The moderate pressure from above, from the layers, helps compact the grains together to form a rock. And as compaction happens, the pore spaces in between the material gets less and less, and water also is reduced as it's squeezed down. Now, water in these pore spaces can also be holding minerals, and it can later precipitate out to form a cement that helps to hold these rocks together. And so with compaction and cementation, we have a sedimentary rock. Now let's take a closer look at some of the features we can find in various sedimentary rocks. Now I already mentioned that we can define clastic sedimentary rocks by grain sizes, but we can also look at things like the roundedness of the grains. This tells us something about the maturity of the grains in the rock. They can be defined as very rounded, where you see the edges of the grain are rounded off, or they can be really angular, and thus you'll see sharp edges on those grains. Another thing we can look at is the sorting. Do we have a rock with grains that are of similar type and size? Or do we have one where the grains are of lots of different sizes? When they're similar, we call it well sorted, and when they're not, we say they're poorly sorted. Some examples include this sandstone. That's a well sorted sandstone. The grains are quite similar as you can see, and we find this in things like beach sands. Meanwhile, streams provide a great example of poorly sorted sediments. Now this information is actually really useful because it helps us determine the setting of the rocks that we have. So here's a great example. If I have a rock like this, like a breccia or conglomerate, it usually consists of poorly sorted and either angular or rounded grains. Now that's the clue I need. If they're rounded grains, they may have been deposited in something like a river. But if they're angular grains, they probably didn't move far from the source. And this is common of things like volcanic breccias or breccias as the result of glacial activity. Now those things tell us something about the textural maturity of the grains in the rock we have. But we can also look at the minerals within the rock. And the minerals can tell us what it's made of and imply the compositional maturity, which also tells us how long these grains have been in the system. Rocks that consist of a lot of plagioclase and olivine have low stable minerals and thus haven't been in the system for very long. But on the contrary, rocks like the sandstone with well-rounded coarse grains have been moved around for quite some time because quartz is a very stable mineral. Colors also provide some clues. Darker colors indicate sulfides and organic matter, which tells us it formed in a reducing environment. And, and reds tell us it came from an oxidizing environment where there was a lot of oxidized iron, and that indicates to us that it was a terrestrial, not a marine environment. The classic red beds of the Permian and the Triassic are great examples of this kind of terrestrial material. Another important feature associated with sedimentary rocks are fossils. We tend to look for fossils in sedimentary rocks, not the other kind of rocks, because the heat and pressure in metamorphic and igneous rocks tends to destroy fossils. So here we have a siltstone, and what we can see are some marine fossils. And fossils can tell us a lot about the environment in which the rock formed. Fossils can tell us the age of the material. In fact, sometimes they can restrict the age very narrowly. Fossils can also tell us, again, if it was marine or terrestrial, lake or river deposits. They can also tell us something about the ecology of the organism that lived at the time, the predator-prey relationships, what they ate, if there were changes going on in the environment, such as climate change. Some other interesting sedimentary features that you may come across include the following. Mud cracks. You can see mud cracks in places that have fine sediments, especially after it rains. Similarly, a popcorn texture results from the interaction of water on fine sediments like ashes and muds, common in places like the South Dakota Badlands, as well as those Mesozoic sediments in the mudstones 
of the Morrison and Mancus formations in Utah. Another feature you might see are ripple marks, the result of wind or water moving sediments around and leaving these interesting snake-like patterns. You can see these in modern environments as well as recorded in the rock record, and it tells us something about the medium that moved it as well as the directionality. If you ever see successive layers at angles like this, you're probably looking at what's known as cross-bedding. And this tells us that this material, these sand grains, were moved by wind and deposited in something like ancient sand dunes. In addition to mineral crystallization and fossils, you can also see dark markings in sedimentary rocks like this, which are iron concretions. Then there are those odd fins, arches, and balanced rocks, the stars of many of Utah's national parks. And these are simply the result of differential weathering. Now that you know the basics of sedimentary rocks, stay tuned because I'll be talking more about fossils and minerals and each of the sedimentary rocks that we've talked about here today in more detail, plus all the other rocks that you'll find out there in the field when you're rock hounding or exploring geology. So stay tuned here at Let's Go Geo because there's a lot more awesome geo adventures yet to come. I'll see you guys next time.